Genesis 22, we've been working through the book of Genesis and we're going exegetically through this book um, and, and we're wanting to just unfold what Scripture has to say to us. And we, we started off in the first section of Genesis, Genesis 1 to 11, it is known as prehistory or, or, or the history of the world essentially. It starts with creation and, and goes all the way through to the Tower of, of Babel. Uh, and then at Genesis 12, uh, we start the story of the patriarchs, namely Abraham first, the father of faith. And he's not only the father of, of Judaism, but he's also the father of faith that, that speaks into Christianity as well. And in actual fact, his, his covenant is, is one of the ones that we partner with, that, that speaks to us well, as still applies to us. And it's the seed of Abraham, Jesus Christ specifically, that blesses us, that we have our inheritance in. And because Jesus is the seed of Abraham, we too are also in that covenant with Abraham, blessed like he was and inheritors of that promise as well. So because uh, Abraham, through him, it was promised, there's this lineage story that plays itself out really for the rest of Genesis. And after Abraham, it goes to Isaac and Isaac goes to Jacob and Jacob has 12 sons. That's where the 12 tribes comes from. One of those sons is Joseph, and we follow his story. And by the time we get to Genesis 50, you've got essentially uh, 70 of the family down there in Egypt, which then is the, is the beginning of, of, of the Exodus story. That, uh, that 400 years later, 70 of them turned into millions, and, and that's when they had to leave uh, Egypt. But, uh, but if we reverse all the way back to Abraham, Mariana preached a great message about Abraham last Sunday, and today I'm going to pick up the story with Isaac. Now, Isaac is one of the patriarchs of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, are generally collectively referred to as the patriarchs of Judaism. And they also, in many ways, have an a allegorical story that's overlaid to their history. Now, to let me um, put this simply for you, the Bible tells historical details about historical people. However, due to the supernatural power of God's Word, there is also spiritual meaning and principles that are outlaid in the details of that history. And so today we're going to hear the story of Isaac, but in many ways we're going to see the story of the church. We're going to see our story in his historical details. We're going to see the story of, of Jesus and the cross of Calvary played out in Genesis 22. And then we're going to see the story of Isaac once again as a picture of Jesus playing out in his marriage to the church in the historical details of his marriage to Rebecca. And as we go through that, I want you to just keep two things in mind. Here's a bit of homework for you. I want you to go home, just do a bit of research and ask and, and just do an analysis of how many parallels are between the life of Isaac and the life of Jesus. And you'll see there's actually quite a long list there. And, and maybe as we go throughout this story, maybe think to yourself details. I'm going to point a few out to you, but there's going to be more than what I point out. Maybe you can notice uh, details in the life of Isaac that, pit, that point to the life of Jesus. So we're going to start the story in Genesis 22. And it's a story that many will know. It's a very famous story. It's a story that... that Abraham takes Isaac up a mountain, Mount Moriah specifically, and God asks Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. Now, this if you don't know much about the Bible, this should have blown your hair back straight away. It's like, what? God interested in human sacrifice? How could that possibly be? And you'd be right in saying that. That's totally contrary to the nature of God. God is not interested in human sacrifice. And as a matter of fact, God was setting himself apart from the other gods of his day in that region at that time who were interested in human sacrifice. And so on the one hand, Abraham would have been very comfortable with the idea. On the other hand, after the introduction and the revelation of who God is to Abraham, he would have thought, this is not the God that I serve. That's what other gods do, but this is definitely not what God is interested in. But by faith... He was obedient to that instruction. And we read later on in Hebrews uh, chapter 11 that actually Abraham's faith was to the point that even if the sacrifice went through, Abraham knew God would raise him from the dead. And the writer of Hebrews highlights that in 11, 19, 17 to 19. He says this, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promise 
offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac, your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received in a figurative sense. So in other words, Abraham was so confident in who God was, his character and his nature, that even if the sacrifice went through, Abraham knew God could raise Isaac from the dead because he knew God was faithful to his word and to his promise. And God said, Isaac is the one that is going to be the one that brings the seed of the promise through. So in other words, Abraham was very much of this mindset. Uh, God, I don't have a problem. You've got a problem. And we need to be so confident in our word and the promise of God. We need to have that same attitude. Like God, you said you would provide. So I don't have a problem. You've got a problem. God, you said... And you're a healer. So I, I don't know. You've got a problem. I don't have a problem. You've got the problem. Because yeah. you said you would oversee your word. Now, now I, I, I know you're thinking, well, that, that, that's a little bit bold for you to say to God. Yes, on the one hand, I agree. Like, don't take that too far. But on the other hand, it's the confidence in the word of God, in the faithfulness of who he is, that gives us that confidence to speak yeah. to our father like that. Yeah. My kids do it to me all the time. <laughs> Dad, you said... So, so we don't have a problem. You've got a problem, Dad, because you said we'd get a treat. You said we'd get dessert. It's not about problem, Dad. Go sort it out. And I, and I don't smite them for saying that. You know, I don't, I don't banish them to their room. As a matter of fact, it's good that they remind me. I, I like that they remind me. Dad, you said it's good. Oh, yeah, I did. I said that. I better, I better do that. I better, I better solve that because I said. And God so much more than me. God's actually a better father than me. And so much more that he is definitely going to oversee his word, oversee his promise. And this was Abraham's confidence. We, we, let's pick up the, the reading in, uh, in chapter 21. Sorry, 22, verse 1. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. One of the most powerful things you can say as a believer is, here I am. Just keep coming back to that. Just keep coming back to, here I am, Lord. Here, Every time God reveals himself to you, every time he asks or requires, or every time he tugs on your heart, just say, here I am. See, one of the things that we can most powerfully activate our faith in is not only recognizing the faithfulness of God, but likewise responding in faithfulness to God. The most common word that Paul uses for faith in the New Testament is the word pistis, and its, uh, it's, most, its most original foundation or idea of understanding is faithfulness, not just faith, but faithfulness. So, so God's faithfulness to Israel and God's faithfulness to Jesus and God's faithfulness to the church is demonstrated in this way. So the, the word faith is demonstrated by faithfulness, but likewise, when we respond to God's grace through faith, it's a great way to understand it by responding. We respond in faithfulness to God's grace. How do we apprehend? How do we lay hold of? How do we take what grace has provided? We take it by being faithful to the covenant that we've been invited into. Not only do we recognize God's faithfulness, but we likewise recognize that we are faithful to that calling and to that grace. The lifestyle that God has asked you to live, a lifestyle of faithfulness and obedience, is a lifestyle that we should be adhering to in commitment. When we get to heaven, I want you to know there's going to be two pivotal questions that we are going to need to answer. Were you faithful to my calling? Were you obedient to my voice? I, I, I really believe when we stand before the Lord at the beam of seat judgment, there are going to be pivotal questions that we need to answer. It's like, Lord, I did this and I did that. I pursued this and I pursued that. But were you faithful to my calling and were you obedient to my voice? Yeah. I, think, I think that is going to be of primary focus when we stand before the Lord. We might not be saved by good works, but we are saved for good works and what stopped the Israelites entering the promised land, highlighted by Hebrews chapter 4, is a lack of faith and disobedience. In other words, the promised land was delivered, the promises were sealed, the giants were defeated, the armies were victorious, except 
They weren't activated through the faithfulness and the obedience of the people of God. And so there are victories that God's already given you. There are callings that he has already delivered you and made you successful in. But out of his pistis, his faithfulness, we need to likewise respond in faithfulness. And we see this highlighted by Abraham here in verse 1 with a simple yet beautiful, here I am. Don't overcomplicate faith. Here I am. You want me to go and sacrifice, Lord? Here I am. You want me to go serve, Lord? Here I am. You want me to go be a demonstration of your loving kindness? Here I am. You want me to be faithful in my marriage and love them anyway? Here I am. You want me to raise my children in the ways of the Lord? Here I am. It's a diligent and faithful servant, I believe, that has such a power to their faith. In verse 2, he goes on, he says, Then he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah. You know, in Genesis, one of the concepts that we're pursuing here, and we've actually named the whole theme, end from the beginning. The end from the beginning. In other words, God's only got plan A, and he starts at the end and works his way backwards, that he's already completed what he started. He doesn't start and then just meander his way through to something that looks good. He starts with a perfected, finished end, and then works his way backwards and allows us to journey through what he has already established. And here, we see that in the book of Genesis, there are laws of first mention that play themselves out through the rest of Scripture. And you've never heard that principle before. It is a principle. It's, it, it's probably deceptively named the law of first mention because there are certain, ex, uh, certain exceptions to this law. But there is certainly a principle of first mention that whatever a word first or a concept or an idea first is established in Scripture it will follow the same meaning and definition for the rest of Scripture. And here we see the very first mention of the word love. The very first time the word love is mentioned in Scripture is in Genesis 22, and it's in direct correlation to the picture of a father offering up his son as a sacrifice. And if we follow the concept of love through the whole narrative of Scripture, we see that that meaning does not deviate. That by this, we know that He loves us. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That the definition of love, the first mention of love, the principle of love is that of that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So the very first time we see the word love is in the picture of a father sacrificing his son. In verse 3, uh, it goes to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering, one on the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey. Now I told you to keep an eye out for correlations between Jesus and Isaac. And so Isaac is being offered up as a sacrifice and he's being taken to the mountain of that sacrifice on a donkey. Who else rode into the mountain of Jerusalem on a donkey? Jesus, well done, ding, ding, ding. There's a prize for you at the back. And took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and he split the wood for burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. Now, up until now, it's taken him three days' journey. In Abraham's mind, Isaac is dead. God asked him to sacrifice Isaac. And so from that moment on, Isaac's dead in his mind. It's a done deal. Here I am. But on the third day, there's going to be a deliverance, and Isaac's going to come back to life. Anybody else come back to life on the third day? Jesus. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey and lad, and I will go up yonder and worship and will come back to you. Now, you don't pick this up in the English, but on three separate occasions in the Hebrew, it is a firm verb. It's a very assertive verb. In other words, Abraham is not wishy-washy about what he just said. 
he is fully confident of the declaration. He said, stay here with the donkey and the lads and I will go up yonder. We will definitely go up yonder and we will definitely worship and we will definitely come back to you. Amen. Is essentially what, it, what he did. That's how firm he was. In the, you don't pick this up in the English, but in the Hebrew, it, it's firm. It, it's, it's assertive. It, it's, it's saying like it's a done thing. We're definitely, we're going to go up. We're definitely going to worship and we're definitely going to come back. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. Can you think of another son that carried wood up a hill to die? All right, you're starting to get the picture. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Now there would have been a conversation between a father and a son that essentially would have gone along the lines of, son, you're actually the sacrifice. Now, keep in mind, I just want to give a rough ages of where these gentlemen sit. Isaac would have been somewhere between 25 and 37 years old. You know, if you grew up in Sunday school in the 80s and 90s like I did, uh, you would have had um, a nice, beautiful felt board highlighting the Bible stories for you, and two things would have happened. One, Jesus would have been blonde and looking Swedish, and two... Uh, Isaac would have looked like a young child. Isaac was not a child. He would have been somewhere between 25 and 37 years old. Abraham would have been well over 100 years old because Isaac was born at 100 uh, when Abraham was 100. And and so uh, Abraham is very much an old man. Isaac is very much a man. And so Abraham would have zero chance, I would believe. I'd I'd fairly much say Isaac, uh, Abraham would have a, a, a difficult time trying to get Isaac by surprise and tie him up and bound him up. So that means there would have had to have been a conversation along the lines of, son, you're actually the sacrifice. And the conversation from the son back to the father would have gone, Abba, is there any other way? Does that bring back any memories of conversations that would have happened between a father and a son on the same mountain? And the father would have said, no, there is no other way. This is what God has asked us to do. And so Isaac, in his own faith and in his own obedience, would have surrendered to what God had asked them to do. Just like Jesus himself surrendered to the father's will. He said, not my will, Lord, but yours be done. But then Abraham also said, to Isaac, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they went to a place in which God had told them, and Abraham built an altar there and placed wood in order, and he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him up on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord, and that would have been Jesus, called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. Imagine that. Jesus is the one actually stopping this with also foreknowledge that he would be the fulfillment of what Abraham and Isaac was playing out. But the angel of the Lord said, Abraham, Abraham. And Abraham responded with, here I am. And he said, do not lay a hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son your only son from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Imagine that, a ram caught in a crown of thorns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Now, there's two ways you can interpret Jireh, uh, Jehovah Jireh. God, my provider, is certainly a faithful way to define that and interpret that. But a, a deeper and correlating definition alongside the Lord has provided is also the Lord, the Lord has seen. Or, or, or directly translated, Yah sees, the Lord sees. So in other words, there was a prophetic rehearsal playing out 
what the Lord knew was going to take place on that same mountain years later. And so the Lord sees it, but also it says later on in that same verse, the Lord on the mountain, it will be seen. In other words, the provision of the Lord millennia later will be seen on this mountain. And so it was. Millennia later, the provision of Jesus from God the Father to all humanity, to whosoever, to come and accept that free will gift offering, the provision of God's salvation, to redeem the spirit, to save the soul, and to glorify the body is an invitation still today open because of that provision that Mount Moriah has seen. Now, to explain geography of Israel is difficult, but let me explain to you that that Mount Moriah also has several peaks or several mounts on it. And one of those mounts is where the temple is, the the temple mount. And and on the temple mount is is something called the Dome of the Rock. It's a temple that belongs to Islam. And underneath the ground surface of the Dome of the Rock is a rock. That's why they call it the Dome of the Rock. Very creative. And, And that rock there is believed to be the spot that Abraham offered up Isaac. It's also Jewish conjecture that it's also the same rock that God fashioned Adam on. That's, that's where the Garden of Eden is, and that's the same spot that, that God created Adam. However, if you go up Mount Moriah a little bit further, you end up at a higher peak, and that is actually the highest peak on the mountain. And that, that peak, that mount, is called Golgotha, where Jesus was crucified. Now, I would suspect that actually, if you were Abraham and Isaac making a sacrifice to the Lord on that mountain, you would probably go to that highest peak. And I would not be surprised, I can't prove this, but I would not be surprised if actually it wasn't the Temple Mount, although it might be, that actually it was the the very spot of of Golgotha that Abraham was sacrificing Isaac, the same spot that Jesus was crucified millennia later. And because of his faithfulness, God's faithfulness, that is. We all can see salvation because the provision of the Lord was seen on Mount Moriah. God will provide. Amen. Why don't we give Jesus a praise clap there. But let's have a look at Abraham. See, because we too, likewise, we go through trials and tests of our faith. It's very common. Matter of fact, it's part of how we grow in our faith is by, by going and testing the faithfulness that we submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Warren Wearsby puts it this way. He says, Our faith is not really tested until God asks us to bear what seems unbearable, do what seems unreasonable, and expect what seems impossible. He, he, can you imagine being asked to go beyond What is reasonable? Well, yeah, that actually happens quite often in the life of faith. The life of faith is one that we live not in the physical realm, not by what we see, but what what we know of Jesus Christ and His promise. We see sickness, yet we believe healing. We see brokenness, yet we believe restoration. We see poverty, yet we believe prosperity. We always go beyond what seems impossible. But there is a certain type of faith test that comes along which actually tests where our heart is in relation to the blessing of God that He has already delivered. You see, Abraham was facing a test here that was to give up the promised one, the blessing that God provided in the first place. There are things in our life that if we're not careful the blessing will become greater than the blesser. Like like we live in comfort and beauty and provision here in the West, mostly because we built our nation on Judeo-Christian values and there is a blessing that has flowed from the declaration and the preaching of the gospel at an institutional level. That is mainly one of the primary reasons why Australia is so blessed. But we could be living in this blessed, prosperous land and we could sometimes idolize the blessing over the blesser. And so we get so... Uh, so focused and committed to the house 
and the holidays and the, the, the comfy lifestyle and the relaxation and putting our feet up and the prosperity of the nation that we live in, delivered by the gospel in the first place, that we actually let the relationship and the intimacy with the blesser take a back seat and now our blessing has become an idol. It's from God, it's from heaven, it's scriptural, but it's an idol. What have you allowed to become an idol in your life, even if it's from God? What if God came along and asked you to lay your blessing down? You've received a business, and and, and that business has grown. It's multiplied. You're now blessed. You're now buying multiple houses. You're now holidaying. Your family's looked after. But but what if God came along and said, okay, I want you to now give away 50% of your profits. Would that be a struggle for you? Or has the blessing become greater than the blesser? What about the security and the ability to provide for your family? That comfort, that knowing that your kids are looked after, that the food is on the table, roof over your head. And so now that's that's what you have now made as the primary focus of your life, that the protection of your family is now squarely resting on your shoulders as opposed to putting your relationship in the protector, the defender, and the banner of our life, Jesus Christ. As the blessing become greater than the blesser. What about our careers? God's blessed you with a great mind. You're able to study. You're able to develop yourself. You've got promotions at work. You've gone up the ranks. And now you're so busy and so tired, you cannot get up in the morning to read your word and to spend time with him because the blessing has become greater than the blesser. And so our faith becomes diluted and where God sometimes has to test us in our pistis, in our faithfulness, is am I still number one? Am I still your first love? Am I still the one that you relentlessly pursue with everything that you have? Or is the comfort and the lifestyle and the, and, and the, and the blessing become the focus of everything that you do? You see, this is something I I, I do have to bring this to attention to Western-style Christianity because our spirituality has become consumer-driven more than discipleship-driven. We we come to church to consume and to be blessed and to receive instead of taking the mindset of the kingdom of coming to church and wanting to contribute as co-laborers of Christ and meaningful body members of the ecclesia. Some of us sit there and be like, well, you know, worship wasn't that good today. Uh, You know, the the lights were flashing, the smoke haze was too much, the the keys player wasn't good, and I don't like that song, we've played that too much. Forgetting that you're the actual worshipper of the Lord, you're the priest of the Lord, and worship is a contribution, not a consumption. If worship wasn't good, get your hands up, get your spirit right, start praying in the spirit so that they start hitting the right chords. Uh, The the sermon wasn't that great today. Pastor Josh didn't tell too many jokes, didn't make me laugh enough, and he was too harsh and he talked about money. Well, why don't you start praying in the Spirit, start agreeing with me in faith, and collectively, through the declared Word of God, we can all get in agreement and change the spiritual atmosphere over this city. Not because I preach good and told good stories, but because as an ecclesia, we came along and we got into agreement as contributors of sitting in God's blessing and contributing according to the blesser. Instead of consuming, we contribute. Abraham gave. Abraham gave all the time. God gave, but Abraham gave. Let, let's go through a list. I got off Dr. Constable of, of, of what God gave and what Abraham gave. Abraham left his homeland and God gave him a new one. Abraham left his extended family and God gave him a much larger family. Abraham offered the best kind of land to Lot and God gave him more land. Abraham gave up the king of Sodom's reward, and God gave Abraham more wealth. Abraham was willing to give up Isaac, but God, through Isaac, gave Abraham numerous seed. Abraham was more focused on what God, what he could give God than on what was God was giving him. 
But, but today's believer, not in this church, I'm just letting you know what people in other churches do. In other people's church, it's like, well, you know, it, it, this, is, this is my Sabbath, this is my call, this is my ministry, my family, you know, th- this is my... Ble- the, the, the emphasis of the Western Christian can sometimes be my, but the emphasis of the kingdom is him. Yeah. We need to shift our perspective from the my, get your focus off I and my and me. And fix your faith on Him. Because when you get Him, you get everything. What, you think you're going to get Jesus and miss out on a home? You think you're going to get Jesus and miss out on health and wholeness and joy? He turns your mourning into dancing. He turns your sorrow into joy. When you have Jesus, you have everything. So give Him everything because He'll always give you more. Well, now that I've received salvation, I better just cling this stuff to myself. No, give it back. It's better to give than to receive. It's better to sow. And you'll get a harvest abundantly above, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, not only into your life, but into the lives of those all around you. Abraham knew, Lord, it all comes from you. Even if I have to slay Isaac as a sacrifice, you can raise him back to life. Even if I have to lay my career down, you can, you can pick it up again. Even if I have to lay my business down and give you 90% of my profit, you can turn that 10% into millions and make me still a prosperous man off that. Because once I have Jesus, I've got everything. What was the last thing God asked you to do? And has it been done yet? What was the last thing God challenged you to step into? And has it been done yet? What's the last great step of faith that made you come alive? And is it so long ago you can barely remember? What is the great test of faith that God's asking you to step into today? Because whatever He's asking you to lay down, I promise you, He's got much greater waiting to bring into your life. Let me just quickly tell you a story of, of Genesis chapter 24. And, and, and I wish I could spend a lot more time on this, but we just don't have the time. We're going to jump into Jacob next week. But essentially, Genesis 24 is Abraham sorting out a wife for Isaac. And, and in between 22 and 24 is, is in 23, the death of Sarah. Uh, so if you, let me just, just skip 23 and just go stick to the story of Isaac. The father wanted to sort out a, a wife for Isaac. And, and so he asked his, his servant to go and negotiate a dowry and to go find a wife from his kinfolk, from his, from his family back where he came from because the Canaanite women, he didn't want Isaac marrying a Canaanite woman. They were, they were, they were idol worshippers. They were moon worshippers. They were really quite, a, quite an evil people. Uh, and, and so Abraham definitely knew he didn't want to marry uh, Isaac marrying one of those daughters. He wanted one of the ones from back home. You know, like a girl you could bring your home, mom, your, home to your mum. He wanted one of those. And so he sends his, his servant to go find one, a suitable wife for Isaac. And, and he finds Rebecca. And the whole story and how it outplays is a beautiful picture of the providence of God, which is his goodness in working the, the, the universe together according to his glory. And and when Rebecca comes back, she sees Isaac and and they fall in love and and Isaac loved Rebecca dearly. But if you allow me to tell the story in this way, it's actually a picture of the father, Jesus and the church. You see, the father wanted a bride for his son. And so he sent the unnamed servant, Holy Spirit, to go and to invite And to ask the wife, Rebecca, if she would go back to the land of his master and marry his master's son. And Rebecca says yes. She chooses to go, which is really uncommon in those days. Mostly this stuff was sorted out and the the girl didn't have much choice. But in this particular story and in Jewish culture in general, the the, the daughter actually has a say. Uncommon to the other cultures around them at that time. And so they bring Rebecca in and they say, Rebecca, will you go with this man to marry the son? And Rebecca says, yes. 
I will go. Now, a couple of things I want to highlight to you, because this is a picture of the bride marrying Jesus. First of all, Holy Spirit is the unnamed servant. Whenever you see the unnamed servant, uh, it's a picture of Holy Spirit. Another great place you see this motif play out is in the story of Ruth, where it's the unnamed servant that introduced Boaz and Ruth together, a picture of Christ and a picture of the church. But the unnamed servant in this story comes with 10 camels laden with treasure. So Holy Spirit comes with gifts. Now, the fact that Abraham had 10 camels highlights the fact that he was a very rich man. The fact that those 10 camels were laden with treasure means the guy was ridiculously prosperous. Like, there are certain churches that Abraham would not be welcome in because he was way too much into prosperity. Like, demonstrated God's prosperity way too much. Not welcome at the door. Get out of here. But anyway, Abraham was prosperous. And Abraham sowed that prosperity into the church with a ridiculous gift, Holy Spirit, immeasurable wealth of His grace, the inheritance of the kingdom, 10 camels worth of treasure. And when, when Rebecca comes back, she sees Isaac and it looks like he was praying or meditating or spending time with God and his mum had just died. And so Isaac Rebecca gets down and, and they get married and, and they go, but the, the land or the place where Isaac was at was Beer Lahoira. And, and that is the place, and if you translate it from Hebrew uh, into English, it means the well, the well, the living one who sees me. The living one who sees me. Rebecca meets Isaac at the well of the living one who sees me. Or another way it could be translated is the well of the vision of life. And I love that Holy Spirit leads us to a place where we meet Jesus and it's the well of the living one who sees me. It's the well, the river that never runs dry, the living water that brings the vision of life. I don't know what life looks for you this morning. It may be confusing and dark and dank and lifeless. And you might feel unseen this morning, but I want to let you know the Holy Spirit wants to introduce you to the one who's waiting and he's waiting for you at the well of living waters that is the one who sees you. He sees you. Jesus sees you. He sees you where you are. And here's the other thing. Scripture goes out of its way to mention that Rebecca was beautiful. I want you to know you're beautiful. God sees you and He says you're beautiful. He goes out of His way to tell you. Now, I know you talk to people uh, and you watch Facebook and you see the, you know, the heresy hunters online and they'll tell you that the church is, is ugly and the church is you know, idolatrous and the church is doing a bad job and they're toxic and the church and the church and... Shut up. Because the only voice that matters... Is the fact that the father and, and the son look at Rebecca and say, she is beautiful. She is washed by the blood of the lamb. She is pure. She is spotless. She's a beautiful bride. So I don't know what shame or condemnation or guilt you got in your life this morning. I'm telling you, it's not from God. And if it's not from God, you don't want it. You're beautiful. That's the way Jesus sees you. One last thing I want to highlight in this story before we move on to Jacob. Between Genesis 22 and the picture of Calvary and Genesis 24, where, where Isaac marries Rebekah, Isaac isn't mentioned at all in Scripture. Now, he's there. He obviously journeys back with Abraham and, and he's obviously there for the, the death of his mom and all that, but He's not mentioned in Scripture. From the time that he leaves Calvary to the marriage supper of the Lamb, Isaac isn't seen. And so this is a picture of John 14, where Jesus, in marriage talk, in love talk, says to the church, says to his disciples, I go to prepare a place for you, so that where I am, you may be also. In my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would say. And that's the words that Jesus wants to speak over you today. 
Jesus is in heaven and he's preparing a place for you right now. He has left earth. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And don't get me wrong, Jesus can come back to earth and he's omnipresent. No, he's God. But if, if you get the picture and idea, God is in heaven. Jesus is in heaven. He's preparing a place for you, the beloved of God, the bride of Christ, because he loves you and he wants to be with you and he cannot wait to come and get you at the rapture of the church and the resurrection of the saints. Amen. Come on.